Okay. Well, welcome everyone. We are interviewing a special guest today, a friend of the show who's been here for a very long time that we've had the pleasure to work with. Um, and we want to introduce everybody to friend Steve Hodel. Um, Steve, you have written a number of books that we're very familiar with, that our audience is very familiar with. Um, but you gave us more gifts in the George Hodel saga last year in two books for people watching right here, <laughs> two huge books dedicated to the 1920s and 1930s. Amazing stuff. Amazing. Um, I, I wonder if we could start off by you telling us why you wanted to document the early life of your father in these works and what else you really just wanted to explore before his life intersected with Elizabeth Schwartz. Okay. Yeah, basically. So initially uh, I came out with Black Dahlia Avenger uh, in 2003. And as your readers and you may know, I was going to show my dad had nothing to do with those crimes. Completely clear. And it was ridiculous. So I made the mistake of following the evidence and uh, it took me 180 degrees in the opposite direction. Black Dahlia Avenger came out in 2003, which made a pretty definitive case against George as being the actual suspect. And of course, the following books, uh, Black Dahlia Avenger 2 and 3 came out with additional linkage where we got to be really beyond a reasonable doubt as far as him being guilty for that and the other L.A. lone woman murders. So those started in the 40s. But as I was researching, researching uh, it, I, of course, I came across the fact that there were other murders that looked very suspicious earlier. Dad in 1947 was 40. He didn't wake up and say, I think I'll be a serial killer. So basically, uh, I knew there must, must be crimes before the 1940s. And uh, so I finished uh, the five books. And then uh, basically, I said, now I'm going to go back and look at uh, the early years. And I thought it would be one book. Uh, much to my surprise, actually, I would discover that he actually started in his teens and never stopped. So that took me through crimes, looking at crimes into the 20s and into the 30s. And uh, basically, uh, I present in the new books, uh, part one and two, I present 25 crimes now, I'm not saying he did these crimes. I'm saying, here's the evidence. Here's right. the linkage. I let the reader decide for themselves. So basically, um, I, I couldn't quite believe that there would be that many. So what we wound up with, with George Hodel was 50 crimes in 50 years. Wow. Basically. That's and, crazy. Um, some of these are very strong uh, linkage and uh, really almost could win in court beyond a reasonable doubt. Others, mm, I don't know, but it fits. Sure, so, sure. So that's what I did with the two books. Uh, uh, and basically one of those, of course, what took me to Pasadena and Dr. Leonard Seaver and the Don Juan Dennis murder, the Sphinx murder. Well, thank you for that perfect transition. That brings us to this unsolved murder case in part two, the 1930s, which is the Sphinx murder of Dr. Leonard Seaver in Pasadena. In our episode in this case, we laid out the elements of the crime as well as some theories and leads that the police of Pasadena depart, <clears throat> excuse me, as well as some of the theories and leads that the po Pasadena police department had back in 1933 when this occurred, but it remains a cold case to this day. So can you break down some of the reasons you think that your father, George Hodel, might be responsible for this? Sure. Yeah. So basically, uh, it's, it's one of the chapters in uh, the early years books. And uh, uh, there are a number of things that really jumped out at me. Uh, unique uh, crime signatures, MOs to, to, to George Hodel. And uh, the, these were basically uh, the fact that, well, number one, he lived, he was lived in the area. His residence was five miles away. He lived in South Pasadena and about, I think about 4.6 miles from the actual crime scene. Right. Um, 
The other thing was, of course, becomes very clear. The obvious motive for the killing appears to be jealousy. Um, uh, of course, Dr. Seaver was a, they called him the Don Juan dentist, and he had a lot of girlfriends and was a, a charming, you know, individual, uh, well-known in Pasadena. So uh, had a lot of, apparently had a lot of girlfriends. They seem to document this. Um, many of dad's, my father's crimes, George Hodel's crimes were based on jealousy. Hmm. In fact, another one of the 30s crimes that I present is actually a, a jealousy killing where I believe he killed one of his, his high school students. Oh, um, wow. And, and I, I make a strong connection on that. And it was, she rejected him in high school. And I, I think that was the motive. Um, and uh, so living close by, uh, the other thing was, of course, the, the nature of the crime itself. Um, we have a young, attractive woman that goes just minutes before he's killed. Uh, I think the police pretty much looked at this as she went to warn him. Mm -hmm. Somebody was coming. Somebody was upset. Uh, and we have a description of that woman, which very much fits dad's, the person dad was dating at the time, which was my mother, Dorothy Odell, Dorothy Harvey. Uh, she had just broken up. With, she had been married to John Houston for seven years, broke up with him, came back and hooked back up with George. The description given uh, by the witness, I think it was a secretary at Dr. Seeger's office, was a, uh, uh, I think, 30-ish, uh, early 30s, dark hair. Uh, but the thing that she m mentioned the most was a really good looking Good looker as far as a dresser. Right. Dress very, very chic. Yes. Very yes. chic dresser. Uh-huh. And of course, one of the things my mom was, was a, I mean, tremendously chic dresser. I think that Houston, um, one of his complaints in the divorce was that she was spending lavish amounts of money on clothing. Mm. So, of course, that rang a bell, too. And, and just the, the whole description of her fit perfectly. Now, I'm not saying it was mother. It could have been any woman. Uh, uh, but, but it certainly fits mom. Um, uh, then we get into the crime itself and the suspect actually sends letters in. Right. He sends taunting letters. He sent a watch, a very unusual, that's a very unusual MO. I had 300 murder cases and never had my suspect send a piece of property hmm. to a witness or anyway, George, uh, anyway, I believe there's a strong problem possibility that he, Mailed it. He also feigned, uh, tried to sound like a foreigner, uh, illiterate in the wording in the letter. Uh, I think the law enforcement came back and said, no, this is an educated man. They actually printed an article that whoever wrote the letters is feigning ignorance and um, is actually an educated person. So there was that, which was very uh, unique and unusual. Yeah, the letter was almost difficult to read because of the extreme effort put into the misspellings and the grammar. Right. Um, and it, it's almost comical in right. a way. And the voice in it, uh, of course, many of my, many of George's other crimes, he sends letters in mm -hmm. with the same sound, same sounds as the same voice, basically, mm. as, as the other letters. He's feigning uh, ignorance and uh, illiteracy and stuff. So there's that. Um, and then we have there was a Dr. Wagner who was a witness. Uh, and I think he was in the, he had his, his office in the same building. Right. Uh, we're not really sure how, how much he knew, if he knew anything, but he was considered a witness. Uh, a strange occurrence happens where he goes to, a, takes an actress, Dorothy Dell, to a party. Uh, and they're coming back and they have an accident and they're both killed in the accident. Well, in, in another one of my father's crimes that I lay out, the star witness is actually killed in an accident and many suspect that he, he was run off the road and the car overturned and killed him. Mm -hmm. I and mean, he was a very important witness in one of the other crimes I attribute to George O'Dell. So there's that. And some said in the Seaver thing that there, that was suspicious that there may have been foul play there. So, so we have that. Um, 
But probably the most important linkage to my mind was an article that appeared uh, describing the perfect villain. And uh, this really this really jumped out at me. Um, let me look at my notes here and I'll, so I can be su succinct here. Yes, this um, is the article that they they believe that the DA at the time was the source here of putting out this very unique suspect profile. Exactly. It was, uh, I, I think the DA was Blaney Matthews, as I yes. recall. And uh, uh, this article appeared in the newspaper and it, the headline was Society for a Friend Potential Villain. And here's some, just some bullet points I made uh, that jump out at me. It's a perfect description of George O'Dell at that time and place. The villain, uh, they say in the article, they say villain had jealous hatred for Seaver, but pretended his friendship. Well, see, well, Dr. Seaver was a patron of the arts and music. And of course, dad was a musical prodigy. And that was what, fifth, I think 15 years younger than him. Right. And uh, in Pasadena, he was a musical prodigy and uh, very likely impossible that he was a patron of Dr. Seaver's. Uh, it, that certainly fits. They described, they say the suspect was a dope addict known to fly into frenzies under the influence of narcotics. We know that dad uh, was involved in narcotics use back then as a young, a young man. Um, they described the suspect as a sharp analytical mind, a native cunning and diabolical shrewdness. Mm -hmm. All of those fit with my father's 186 IQ and at Caltech at the age of 15. Um, he, they say he would have provided himself with a perfect alibi. They described him as intelligent and suave and the victor in many battles of wits in Pasadena drawing rooms. Dad did debate and involve himself in Pasadena society and uh, in the drawing rooms there. So he, he was well known as for his intelligence and ability to debate. So it sounds like there's a couple of different ways in which just the social circles would have overlapped for these absolutely. two individuals. A absolutely. Um, that seems to go right along the lines of what you're talking about, jealousy. You know, even if it would, even if it didn't have anything to do necessarily with the woman, which it likely does, right. the idea that here's another well-renowned, socially adept individual. And also they're both snazzy dressers. And I'm sure, <laughs> yes. you know, I mean, the word we're talking about, they're moving in the same circles in, in a way. He's there could be some competition. Yeah. They are. And uh, uh, they go on and they are able to describe as a dabbler in criminology. Mm. Um, said to have become passionately fond of a woman who Seaver was acquainted with. And uh, he, he was an amateur criminologist, uh, did they they asked the question, did the amateur criminologist become a ruthless slayer? So all of these things fit George to a T. And, and um, it made me suspicious enough to where actually I went to, I contacted Pasadena PD, cold case unit, and said, hey, I'd like to come and present, uh, you know, present my information to you and have you take a look at it and see what you can find. Because I was quite confident that if they got into the files, they would find George O'Dell's name there as sure. this individual. So I went, uh, I called and I, I went in and actually I was surprised. I thought I was meeting with a detective, but I actually met with a chief of police, uh, Chief Sanchez at the time. And I did, a, I gave him a 22 page summary along with a, I did a PowerPoint for him, uh, presented it, took me about an hour to present all the evidence to him. So he, he says, well, I'll certainly get with my guys and uh, we'll get back to you and let you know. Mainly, I just wanted to find out was was the name George Hodel, this individual. And uh, so he got back to me in about three weeks or a month and said, well, everything, all the files have disappeared. Oh, so funny like, how that happens so often, right? Yeah. And uh, he I think he, he contacted. I mean, it would have been with the DA's office, more likely. Mm -hmm. and certainly Pasadena would have had a. So certainly some of the information. So there was nothing in Pasadena. And I I don't know if he went to the DA to try and get the information on the name of this, this society fiend, a potential villain or not. So that was kind yeah. of where that was left off. But, but um, everything about this case, along with the fact that dad was an active serial killer before and after this, this crime, really, I think, 
puts him high on the list of, uh, you know, I, there's got to be some way we can find that name of who they're talking about here. They, I mean, yeah, pretty public about it. <laughs> so so you're of the opinion that the DA had a particular person in mind and was describing the the profile of this person, but having the suspect of George Hodel probably at the top of his list. Oh, in fact, the article said they anticipated an arrest. And there's no question they had him, this individual identified. Yeah. OK, got it. Uh, yeah. And so whether it was George Hodel or not, I, I, I think it absolutely was mm -hmm. because there's so many, you know, descriptions here that fit perfectly. Yeah. And and time, place, uh, individual. And, and um, but uh, we need to find out uh, somehow maybe through the DA's office. I'll give, I'll give you guys that assignment. Go to the DA. <laughs> Sounds door, good. Door knock that. <laughs> They're a little busy right now, but <laughs> um, yeah, I, it, you mentioned time and at this period of time, it was December of 1933. And right. so had your, was your father in school? And do you believe that like he was home sort of for that winter break at this period of time in right. living yeah, over there? Was, you know, he had his own home and uh, he, they had their estate there in pa South Pasadena, his yep. parents did. And uh, he, he would, would have been in his first year of, let's see, he's out of pre-med. So he would have been in his first year of medical school at UCSF. And very likely home for the, you know, he had his own private residence tea mm -hmm. house. Yes, he did. Uh, there in, in uh, Monterey Road. And um, so I th think he was, he was very likely home for that time period and stuff. Um, that, that makes sense. But I also have connected him in, in, in the, in the um, early years, I connected him to, a, to a, I think there's about seven or eight serial crimes in San Diego, very active. Some of them he signed at the doctor. I mean, they they huh. really. The interesting thing is removing Steve Hodel from it. San Diego had these crimes connected. They were, of course, they didn't have the term serial killer back there, but they, I think they called them chain murders or something. Mm. Anyway, they believe these seven or eight murders were all connected, and right. I and I make a strong case that George Hodel was committing these crimes during. Well. This. I, I haven't gotten there yet. I'm I'm more than halfway through the first book. And I I love that the first half of the first book really feels like a biography of your father. And one, he's just a fascinating person, even if you took all the murder out of it. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> you know, I would read a book about this person. Um, but one interesting fact that I learned was that his family is Russian. And Dr. Seaver was also Russian. That's right. Do you think that's another sort of overlap of circles that they would have kind of known each other? At, because Seaver didn't really have family here. He came out here from the East Coast by himself. But would he have maybe been drawn to more people in the Russian community in Pasadena at that time? Yeah, although there, there were a lot of, lot of Russian expatriates that, that have okay. come through. So, I mean, that may have been, a, I mean, it may have just been a, of uh, a, a, a coincidence, mm -hmm. but but there may have been more to it than that. Certainly, uh, my grandparents, dad's dad's parents were from Odessa and Kiev, Russia, right. and they went through France. She was an amazing individual. She was a dentist in in nineteen oh one. Can you imagine yeah. a woman being a dentist in nineteen oh one from the Ukraine? Is, yeah, really, that's amazing. It really was, and uh, very high intelligence. And I go into, in my other books, I go into uh, uh, quite a bit of biography. In fact, in this this book, I go into quite a bit of uh, background on my grandparents. Yes. And their remarkable life. And remarkable. I mean, and the the possible connections to just the, the royalty and right. uh, the quote unquote sort of royal families of early America is just Right. Very, very fascinating. And take their um, little they take their little genius boy to Madame Montessori's school in yes. Paris for a year. Yes. You know, <laughs> it just, it's, it's an amazing, amazing uh, uh, background. Yeah, it really is. And, you know, I was just super excited to, one, stumble upon this case of the Sphinx murder on my own but be able to weave it into our vintage series here at LA Not So Confidential. And then to find 
Yeah. Actually, actually, I had I had found out about this case. And then right before you left California, when you and I had lunch, you were talking about getting ready to publish these books. Right. And um, you're like, oh, you know about the Sphinx murder? <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> so it was very neatly tied in. But um, these are just riveting reads, like such quick reads. I love the way that you have laid these out into these bite-sized chunks, but also at the same time, and I don't know how you do this, um, like no stone is left unturned. So it is absolutely in depth, but also just, you're able to, to get through it and you're riveted through them. So thank you for two more wonderful books, Steve. Well, my all of my your pleasure. <laughs> I, you know, and the other thing is that I've had so much help with, you know, you know, there's eight books now and I've had so much help from armchair detectives, you know, my readers yeah. are yeah. amazing. I mean, many of them like would be, I'd be happy to be my partner any day, you know, sure. they've come up with so much additional information to help me. And I suspect this may happen with the early years. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. It's an amazing phenomenon to see how much crowdsourced information comes from people who are really passionate about these cases. Um, I mean, there's certainly some problems with it as well. If people go down the wrong direction, right. But yeah, I mean, especially with all of this historical, we're going back so many years, um, to have somebody that has, can be your adjunct and like, Hey, I was able to go through this record and find this. That's wonderful. That's a wonderful resource. It is. And, and I'm really excited. Uh, I don't know. I think I mentioned to, uh, Dr. Shiloh that, that, uh, we're, I'm, we're doing a, we're in the production now on a uh, series, a, a, a docu-series, uh, adapting my books, five of my books, not the early years, but five of the other earlier books to um, a, a docu-series, maybe four or six hours. Oh, so that's exciting. Well, that's great. Can you tell us any more about it, about what platform it'll be on or where well, it will stream? I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure which. We're, we're, okay. we're in production now. I've got like 35 hours of interviews in the can already with them. And uh, T-Bone Burnett's going to do the music. <laughs> and awesome. and uh, so I, I'm not exactly sure, you know, it's, uh, uh, I don't know how much they want me to put out for now, but but basically okay. we're, we're, we're working on it now. And uh, it's going to be able to, you know, a lot of people aren't going to sit down and read eight books, but they will watch four to six hour Sure. Series. You know. Oh, we know that. Yeah, for and, sure. <laughs> uh, uh, the the uh, director uh, and documentarian is, is a guy named Rob Bidler. He's a he's an award winning. He did Hands on a Hard Body, which was a really cool uh, documentary. It's not what you think. Hmm. So they all know that that was even made a, a, a new Ford. And the last person standing wins the Ford. Yeah, <laughs> it was made into a Broadway musical. It was a great show. It, it's a yeah, very cool exactly. story. And uh, and Rob, you know, the exciting thing about Rob Bindler is he really gets gets the George O'Dell. He gets, mm. you know, gets all of it. That's and it's exciting. not easy to, you know, the whole murder, murder is a fine art theme and all of that. It's surrealism and all of that stuff. But yeah. he gets it. And I'm really excited because um, uh, I think he's going to really do something special. That's amazing. Yeah. You know, when you were talking about the um, sort of these armchair detectives helping you yeah. out. And I'll put this, I'll link this um, blog post of yours in our show notes and in our video. Okay. But so I was exploring, I went over and explored the tea house and this, um, the the home where your, your grandparents and where George lived. And so this is funny, Scott, because I don't know if I told you this, but I found the Zillow listing for just the tea house, which is this tiny, like what, not even 700 square feet. Right. And right. of course it's about a hundred thousand dollars for each little section of that home. Yeah. Um, but in that I sent the listing to Steve and I was like, Hey, check this out. Kind of interesting what the tea house went for and tell us about the art that you saw in the backyard. So you sent me some photographs and I had been there uh, when it was empty and, and through it many years ago and took photographs, but I've never been underneath. Well, there was a picture that you took that was underneath that showed actually a tile and the tile had a very modernistic pattern on it, mm -hmm. very unusual. And I thought, you know, I, and this jumped out at me and I thought, well, this, where did this come from? Did George create this or did, you know, and uh, so now we're exploring the possibilities of, of see if we can identify uh, and connect that with 
you know, a, a modern art or something because it, it was, yeah. it's a very unusual tile. And again, I, had you not taken that picture and sent it to me, I, you know. Well, to be fair, I didn't take the picture personally. It was just from the Zillow listing when they sold the oh, house okay. last. Well, all right. But thank you for the credit. I'll take it. <laughs> um, I wish I had been brave enough to get out of my car and do that. Yeah. But, um, but you sent me the link. That, yeah, that had yeah, all of that yeah. just as interesting of how much that little home went for, which not surprising. And, and, less and the shark house just sold. Yeah, the the Soden house um, yeah. just sold again um, within a couple it's, of days. That sold for six point one million. Yes, Dad bought it for thirty seven thousand. <laughs> oh my gosh, <laughs> I would pay a thousand dollars probably just to tour it. <laughs> I wish I had known it was on the market. I would have said, Scott, you're my fake husband. Let's go. Let's and- do it. <laughs> look into it. Um, well, obviously we could go on and on and on with everything here. Um, but again, Steve, like your, your dedication to investigation, um, as well as your skill set to be able to do that. Just, I love that you continue to do this because it's your passion and because it's what you're good at. Um, even in retirement, retirement. <laughs> yes, exactly. I, you know, uh, I don't, uh, my, my sons are saying, dad, come on now. You're 80. It's time to stop. <laughs> I said, well, okay, well, just, just one more book. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, yeah. if that's what's keeping you so vital, because you, you look better than you did when I saw you, when I met you, I think eight years, no, like six years ago, Yeah. you, you, your energy is through the roof. So whatever you're doing, Keep doing it. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I, I very much enjoy, enjoy enjoy it. You know, it's it's you know, getting to the truth is really what it's all about. You know, and, and uh, so many so many truths have come out in the past twenty two years. Yeah, and uh, uh, you know, the, I do believe that there's that that, that there is a, brings some satisfaction to the at least the, the extended families of sure. the victims. Uh, and uh, that's very rewarding. Yeah. Personally, well, that's very rewarding. absolutely. That's that's lovely to consider and think about. And I hope you've been able to hear from some of them at some point. So, um, well, thanks again for your time, Steve. We uh, always appreciate it. Glad we could connect with you again. Um, we might be up in Washington in October for. Oh, uh, let me know a- because you can stop. I'm only six miles south of the border. Oh, okay. We're going to be near Seattle for a festival, but we'll see what we could do. Okay. That would be great. Figure something out halfway or something. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Well, yes. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll be in touch. Okay. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye.